I am very happy to be here and do the interview with Eric, That's who is an awesome. amazing person. Yay! Thank and, you. And uh, do this interview, so it's going to be fun. Awesome, yeah. So, hello everybody, welcome to our new podcast edition from Wist magazine. Today I'm sitting with Eric Mott, Hello. who is a founder of the band Worldly Savages, yeah. also founder of the company Support Adventure, yeah. and a YouTuber. Yeah. And I, I'm living this uh, sort of transcultural lifestyle. Um, it started being from Canada and wanting to explore my roots in Europe, and then somehow I de developed a thing for the city of Belgrade, Serbia. And then I moved here, uh, lived in London for a year to jumpstart the musical career. And um, then since 2013, I've been remote only, mostly from here. But recently I started living um, half the year in Thailand. Um, and yeah, so it's a whole mess of internationalism and east, west, further amazing. east. So let's talk about it. Yeah, let's talk about it. Sounds amazing. But tell us, how did it all start? How, when did you make the decision to... Uh, travel and to work remote. So you come from Toronto, Canada. Yeah, originally. Toronto, Canada. Yeah. So I grew up there with my family. Um, German people from Slovakia was my fa father's family and my mother was uh, a little bit more Ukrainian, but still uh, a little bit more Canadian, but still half Ukrainian. And I was raised to sort of uh, view Canada as like, it was a good place to live and grow up, but it's the suburbs of the world. It's like the um, place where you can have the easiest, um, most boring life. And, you know, it's not hard to have a decent middle class life there, but having grown up there in a nice neighborhood and stuff like that, I wanted more. And my father was very much um, encouraging me to travel as a child, took me to a bunch of places as I was a child and teenager. And then by the time I was like 18 or 19, I was traveling the world by myself. And going further in Europe every year. It was all about Europe then, because I was discovering parts of myself in Central Europe that were making me feel more like myself than my life in Canada did, than my, the people I was meeting there. So I just I had to explore. I have to cut you there. So what did you find in Europe that you missed in, in Canada? I think this is an interesting point. It, it's something about cultural authenticity. Um, mm -hmm, if, if I can put that as, as like um, the, the grounding layer of what I'm going to explain. Mm -hmm. but. The new world is very, um, is very sort of um, diluted. The culture, you know, you're, you're living in a country like Canada and um, it's based on this culture of colonial um, England and France that's, you know, hundreds of years old mm -hmm. and there's no real strong connection to anything except mm -hmm. for um, American culture, which is obviously on the TV all the time and dominates Canadian culture. So mm -hmm. you've got this like British culture and some French remnants of culture from hundreds of years ago and this dominant American culture and not much else, not much else. And then I came to Europe and not only is there, there this, um, you know, Central European Austro-Hungarian Empire culture that I was raised to feel a part of, but there's so many other different cultures and different spices and elements. And then it was really when I discovered the city of Belgrade, Serbia, where I found something that was combining the, mm -hmm. the familiar stuff that I was raised with, um, and then some sort of exotic, more Mediterranean cultural aspects mm -hmm. that came mm -hmm. from, I, I don't know, the Ottoman Empire, and even before that, and the combination of all of that, and the friendliness of the people in Belgrade, and the mm -hmm. openness, and the sort of like um, potential of the city really, really got me. And so I basically, after a few years of traveling, Belgrade was my spot, and I had made some friends here in my travels here, and I had to move so here. So nice to hear. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it it just means that, you know, it, I'm, people always assume that I have some sort of Serbian background. I don't, but um, there's stuff, this country is well connected with different cultures. So a lot of people come here and they find something that mm -hmm. they resonate with, mm -hmm. even though they have nothing to do with the actual Serbian yeah, culture. Yeah, 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 I understand that. It's a very dynamic place. But uh, okay, you, will, you got inspired in Belgrade and realized I would like to spend here more time. So how did you realize that? How, how was the, yeah, your journey? First trip continue? was 2006, just came to the city for a few days, liked it, mm -hmm. met some cool people, wanted to come back. Um, then mm -hmm. the second year I came, um, I went to the Gucha Trumpet Festival where all the gypsies run around in the village and, and play, play, well, the same five or ten songs. This must be really amazing It was you. amazing Gucha for you. with all the it gypsy playing and amazing. really Balkan yeah, music. Yeah. And then I came to Belgrade after that. Mm -hmm. And then I went back to Toronto after that trip. And I, 
I also went to Ukraine for the first time on that trip. It was a real sort of map changing trip for me, like where I opened up parts of myself and also my consciousness. Musically, the whole, uh, musically yeah, yeah, as well. Must be really the whole inspiring. inspiration for Worldly Savages was starting to get really um, mm -hmm. heavy at that time, the idea of this band. And I went back to Canada and my life was not the same. I couldn't live there anymore. Um, it was. Um, it was the end of the year, mm -hmm. Christmas time in Canada, and I went to this Serbian party, which was uh, a Gucha-style Serbian party in Canada. And oh, wow. it was so, the feeling was so different, even though the whole party was Serbian people, except for me, probably. Mm -hmm. and, um, but the feeling was so not the real culture of Belgrade at that time mm -hmm. that I had experienced mm -hmm. by actually visiting Serbia, Serbia. It felt like a really suburban middle class sort of thing where artificial yeah serbian immigrants um mm -hmm. were there and they were trying <laughs> they were trying to be serbian but it just was not seeming authentic to me so the whole mm. thing like was just like all of this immigrant culture in canada it's like putting your culture in a deep freeze and and it was essentially like serbian people were trying to take their frozen culture and heat it up in the microwave yeah, to have a quick yeah, meal yeah. of it. It's a, it's a very good picture. I like that. And so the next day I was kind of sad that the party wasn't better, that it didn't give me that real Gucha feeling which had captured my heart, the real Belgrade feeling that had captured my heart. And so the next day I decided to uh, move to Serbia in 2008. And at the end of April, mm -hmm. I, I just uh, came to Europe, traveled around for a few months and then settled in Belgrade. And yeah. The stuff that washed over me once I moved here, the whole, whole reorientation of the life, the fact that I had kind of like left behind a lot of stuff there, it kind of, yeah, it all was really uh, overwhelming for a few months, but I was really enjoying living in Belgrade and exploring the city. And then after that, um, there was a death in my family. I had to go back to Canada. And then I realized I could pick up where I left off there every mm -hmm. time I went. So with my IT support clients and stuff like that, and so I settled into this rhythm of living in Toronto and Belgrade for like, um, you know, the following three years where I was doing music mm -hmm. on both sides. And when I went back to Toronto, I was doing my IT support job, um, fixing so, computers. So you were doing that. So were you working that already in Toronto? Like yes. With IT, did you study that? Or no, I just was the kid it? around the neighborhood who could fix computers. And I continued to be that even though I was only there mm -hmm. half the time. People mm -hmm. waited for me. Um, and I started doing remote IT at that time, like fixing computers remotely where you can log in and see their screen and click their mouse and use their keyboard and fix it, it remotely. It was about 2010 or something? 2009, yeah, mm -hmm. 2009. And so I started to have this vision that there could be a way where <laughs> I didn't have to go back to Canada if I got this remote IT thing right, that I could work remotely, get money paid into my account in Canada, take it out in Belgrade and have like a great life and take the best of both worlds and somehow combine them without having to go mm -hmm. to Canada because every time every time I was in Canada doing, during those three years it was just like oh my god I can't wait back to get back to Belgrade where my life my heart actually lives and you know mm -hmm. where you feel alive I guess. where I felt alive yeah and it was like I can't wait to get back I can't wait every time I was just longing for it then when I came back it was a completely different lifestyle and so the ultimate goal became to have the financial stability and the IT profession in Belgrade while having the crazy artistic life mm -hmm. as well. But uh, how, did, how did you then accomplish it? I mean, from having the decision to work remotely and travel uh, as a, from the decision until the making, how, how, until, the, until it happened? Well, in 2009, people were not at all used to the idea of yes, remote work like they are now. So, so normal as today. Since it's, I was the exactly. IT guy, I could explain to them how it works with the technology and they are already clients. They knew me face to face. And so it was possible to just say, okay, I'm going to log into your machine mm -hmm, now. Okay. I had a phone line I could plug in um, here in, into the, the internet and it was like a local Toronto number and I could call them up. And it was like I was in the same city, but I was just mm -hmm. working, mm -hmm. logging in remotely. I don't know. I slowly convinced them, but the money was not enough actually to um, do it full time at that point. And mm -hmm. I was kind of sick of living three months in either place, um, going back and forth. So I decided to just, and I knew I wanted to do music in a big way. And I knew that London would be a place where I could do that. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, because it's a global music center. And so I moved to London. 
and um, put a band Which together. Which year? What time is 2011, that? 2011, I moved to London, mm -hmm. and 2012 was when I had the band together, and we started playing. We played 85 concerts that year. I had a full-time job 85 working. 85 concerts? Yeah. Wow. I had a full-time job working in a, a structural engineering office doing their computer stuff and playing gigs every weekend. It was the most busy and stressful year of my life. I got a lot done, and slowly that started eating away at me. I didn't like living in London. I didn't like going into the office. It was sucking my soul, and so I decided... Um, what, what didn't you like? What, what was so bad in London? Lots of people want to go well, to London. I was always self-employed, right? So working in an office, I was always like working for one hour, going to another place, working for another hour, making my okay. own schedule and stuff like that. So going to an office at 8.30 in the morning every... It wasn't my thing. It wasn't my thing. The gigs were great on the weekend, but I just didn't feel... Um, a connection to London like I felt in Belgrade. I still mm -hmm. had this feeling that like Belgrade is where my soul lives. I need to find a way to be there full time. And so I quit London um, mm -hmm. and continued to do music only for one year with the savings and mm -hmm. the people I'd met in London. And um, then in 2013, I just decided I need to stay in Belgrade. I was running But out of savings. But when I have to interrupt you there, Would you say you moved to London, started playing music? How did this happen with the Worldly Savages and the band? When when did you found it? When did you find people? So I started the, the band in 2008 in Belgrade mm -hmm. with a studio project with a producer here named Vladimir Krakow, and um, we recorded like basically demos or initial songs. And then I started in Toronto to find musicians there. 2010, we came to Belgrade and toured here. So during the three wow, months, three months, I was going back and forth. But then when we went back to Toronto after the first European tour, they had other projects, didn't want to come again. And that's what I decided I need to find new band members because it's a singer songwriter thing. I'm the singer. I write the songs. I need essentially people to play my music with me. It's not so much like a band where everybody's contributing to the songwriting and stuff like that. It's more like my vision and the people I need to execute mm -hmm. that vision, mm -hmm. playing all the instruments. And so I decided to start again in London. Just some ads online and mm -hmm, the music mm -hmm. scene provided what what uh, what we needed at that time. The Eastern European Balkan folk punk thing was like getting really big and we immediately got all these big festivals. But uh, mm -hmm. London was not for me. And then I moved to Belgrade and I needed to find, I was like 30 years old at the time. Mm -hmm. And I needed to find a way that I could be stable and build my life for the next stage. Smart, like I just wanted to be in Belgrade and find a way to work online from my kitchen. And um, so you made it, and how did it happen from London? Let's go back from the London time. So you're playing, living in London, yeah, uh, having a job who pays your your bills, yeah. and also playing all the time music. And how did you make it then from London to Belgrade? Well, I was already in Belgrade half the time before, so ah, Belgrade time, was more yeah. home than London ever was, mm -hmm. even when I was living in London. It But you left like, London at some point totally. Yeah, it was like uh, October 2012. I quit the job. I took the band um, mm -hmm. that I made there. They quit their jobs. We moved into an apartment in Belgrade and we mm -hmm. were just musicians for a year. And basically it was very um, stressful because like money and you know personal space issues. Of course, <laughs> But ultimately, the beginnings are hard, yeah. Yeah, but ultimately, um, you know, that didn't last. But what did last was this vision of working in Belgrade working from Belgrade online, being a musician, and also working in IT. Because mm -hmm. those were two, my two passions. Since I was 11 years old, right. I was playing guitar and doing stuff with computers. And it's still that way today. And merging those two passions with another passion, which was travel, it just kind of all goes into the DNA of what I'm doing. Like the Worldly Savage is the, is the artistic message. Um, and also my YouTube channels, Rising Nomad and Belgrade Beat, The artistic message of being transcultural, traveling the world, um, mm -hmm. getting your message out there with technology and all that sort of stuff. That's that. And the business support adventure is what allowed us to actually do that, what allowed us to build this, um, you know, the stability, financial stability to actually live this dream of traveling the world. And so finally you made it, but uh, so you came back uh, as, as a musician 2012, yeah. I said. And you then it, it was a year, year of just being a musician. And Which was probably fun, I guess. Yeah, it was fun and it was difficult because yes. music, yeah, it's difficult. You know, it's creative, it's uh, not well paid. Every gig is like a battle that you have yeah, to fight yes, um, yes. with a lot of glory as well. Yes, but then you go get got back to Toronto at some point. Yeah. Uh, I didn't uh, no I didn't move uh, back to Toronto since I last time I lived there was 2011. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's 11 years now. So yeah. 
I, I didn't want to go back. I, I don't want to go. I, I would not be surprised if I never lived there again in my life. It's, it's spiritually distant to me at this point. It's just a place where I grew up. There's lots of it in me, but there's also mm -hmm. different stuff now. But you made it, you, you founded this company, Company Support Adventures. Yeah. Tell us more about it. How does it work? Okay, so I started, I found like a company in London that would allow me to work from my kitchen in Belgrade and they would send money. So that essentially became my business. And then in 2015, actually I was living right here in this before it was a recording studio. Um, I got a guy, a Serbian guy, Mario, and he, we were sitting here and I taught mm -hmm, him how to do mm -hmm. the job. And then another one, another one, that was 2015 and... Now it's like 160 people around the world in mm -hmm. 2022. So it's like, it just kind of like built up as like the vision of remote working from places that inspire you and mm -hmm. working from home and having a lifestyle that's um, manageable because a lot of us are, um, you know, we don't want to work in offices. It's a little soul sucking. We don't want to actually have to... Um, be in an open office plan and have our focus distracted. We're, we do our best work when we're alone on the laptop. And yeah, you call people up, get on Zoom calls, mm -hmm. phone calls, whatever, support calls. And yeah, it's fine. So yeah, the whole driving thing was just like, I'm going to work from anywhere. It's none of anybody's business where I'm working from as long as I'm in a quiet place and I have good internet and I do a good job. And so now I like to say we hire people. I don't care if they're from Mars on the moon, as long as they have good internet. So you will find a company who will you work for in London, yeah. who gives you the assignments. Yeah. And meanwhile, you have people who work for you, as I understood correctly. Yeah, so now we have about 60 clients around the world and we're following this um, full-time dedicated staffing co um, company model where we're finding the people and providing them to the company. And so it's like a staffing agency, yeah. So you're doing that since 2012 now? Um, 2013 was when I started that remote working model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And okay. all of the experiments since 2007 of remote working all led to that moment where it became actually a way to make a living. And yeah, all of that living in Belgrade before and long for this place came true. And it actually managed to be my home since then. So you grow, actually you, you started with one company, you, now you have a f uh, several companies you're working for in London? Like are your in assignments? In London, all across the United States, okay. uh, one in Ireland, one in Australia, a couple in Canada, yeah. So it, it goes well, I guess. Yeah, of course, it goes way too well. Growing. You know, it's like overwhelming how well it goes. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's really successful, it's a mature business. I can now take a step back from the day-to-day -day operations and, you know, mm -hmm. sit here and talk to you um, without fear of getting an email that I'm mm -hmm. going to have to, or somebody calling me up or anything. It's fine. Like, um, basically, okay. like, I'm trying to be hands-off with the company so it can grow. I don't want to be a bottleneck to its growth. So I want to just be the visionary. Amazing. Yeah. What would you advise people who would like to do the same, who say, oh my God, the, the lifestyle that Eric has, it's, it's really nice. I would like to do... Similar, how would you start? Yeah, what so I would go, uh, I would save some money, like just just kind of like I did. Save some money mm -hmm. um, and then go and find the place where you can be stable. Mm -hmm. Like rent an apartment and sit, set up a workspace in your apartment. It was the kitchen for me at the first apartment. I was slow cooking stews while I was working. And then I actually decided every day at 10 o'clock until 6 o'clock, I'm working. And my job at that point was to find a job that I can do remotely. Mm. And so every day I would sort of, yes. I would sort of like um, have the routine going. But my job was to find a job, to find business and people who wanted their computers mm -hmm. fixed. Um, and I still had some clients in Toronto who were calling me and I was helping them remotely. But it wasn't enough money to survive. And so then by the time I got my interview from sending emails, um, I was able to look the guy in the eye and sort of say like, yeah, um, I start work at 10 o'clock until six o'clock and any calls from your clients to come in, I'll answer them and fix them because I already had the place mm -hmm. in my mind, the office, the physical space was set up. I was already set up to be productive and envisioned the lifestyle I wanted to have. And then and boom, since I created the space for that, mm -hmm. since I worked hard to get the word out that I was available for that, the job came. Yeah. Great. So yeah. it's really the right and way. And it was just a question of making a list on um, Google Maps, actually, of 100 um, IT support companies in London, pulling their email address from the website, writing a nice uh, short introduction video that explains who I am and what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And basically, after that, um, I got a reply, and it was what I needed. And yeah, 
from there, Perfect. it Amazing. was 15 hours of work of we, 15 hours a week of work, mm -hmm. and yeah, I made 800 euros a month from that 15 hours a week, which was a good deal for them and a good deal for me, and helped me pay my rent. To get it started, yeah. yeah. To get and after that, I wanted more, so I found a second company that was. Mm -hmm. giving me a similar contract and the second company was like oh can you hire some guys over there and train them for us and have them work for mm -hmm. us i was like sure let's try it and so we sat here and basically just um did that and it was a model that worked the first guy was great the second guy worked out well as you know just building the business from there and realizing that it's an actual business and eventually i i think 2007 17 mm -hmm. so like three and a half years into it I stopped doing the actual technical work myself and just became managing the business so I could grow it. Hired a full-time lead generation person from here, Nina, from, she was from Serbia but had mm -hmm. toured the world as a fl flight attendant and basically, yeah, she found clients for the business and it was just now finding more and more clients and more and more people who mm -hmm, wanted to do the mm -hmm. work and finding ways to put the deals together. So you so get it all organized, actually. Yeah. yeah. And you can concentrate more on the things you like, I guess, and to travel. Yeah, now I can concentrate more on the things I like because mm -hmm. um, the business is mature. There were years there, like specifically 2017 and 18, that were really stressful. You know, like, oh, okay. because, you know, you lose a client and then you're stressed out. Mm -hmm. They can't work. You have this overambitious sort of diluted model of oh let's give 24 7 support now and mm, next thing you know like okay. you're having to answer calls at like two in the morning uh, from australia when they start their business right, day it's like sure. it was exhausting and that's the grind and that's what um but you need a little bit of vision to get through that mm -hmm. you know and during that time the worldly savages music project um sort of took a back seat because i realized all the effort to get one person a job um it would be, um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's the same amount of effort I was spending on getting one gig mm. for the band. And so the jobs wow. were lasting years and mm -hmm. the gig was lasting one night. So I knew what I had to do. And now I'm on the other side of it. And I really want to just like do music again. I'm putting a band together again to start playing next year. And it's oh, going to be to the next level of the music I've been recording for the last uh, few years through the corona pandemic in this studio we're sitting in now and um yeah it's it's i'm ready to go with music again and youtube's a big part of the life because now that i'm su successful with uh, the digital nomad thing um still my life is not perfect and there's like a lot of things like i don't have a map on how to live now after you know normally like somebody in my Some position. people like to have it all planned out the next three years and be one place yeah. and you're the opposite. But there's and psychological the freedom, issues of traveling the world and being as unsettled as this. And so, and there's also a lack of community and loneliness you feel when you're traveling too much. And that's the sort of stuff that I'm addressing with the Rising Nomad channel. Those issues, those sorts of like, um, yeah, issues mm -hmm. about like um, transculturalism, feeling, you know, lonely. Because like when I'm on tour with the band, there's no space um it's people all the time mm -hmm. band members mm -hmm. and then fans and mm -hmm. organizers and all that sort of stuff but the digital nomad lifestyle working online on your laptop everywhere it got a little lonely mm -hmm. because you're changing places also you're not only in belgrade you yeah also travel. so you have to start from zero at each new place um and then even if you have been to a place multiple time like uh, for example in like mexico or thailand where i spent last winter i was splitting it between both places it was like you know, you can meet someone one year, but then they're gone too the next time you go there. And it's like, yeah, trying to find this global community of my people. That's the next sort of thing. And having stability in locations. So now I'm between Belgrade and an island in Thailand called Koh Phangan, which is... That was my next question. Yeah. So you didn't stay only in Belgrade, you continued to No, around 2017, once I had uh, become only just sort of like um, the, the managing director of the company rather than doing a the technical work myself, um, I decided to go, well, we were trying to call, I told you about that night shift answering calls from Australia. So then I was like, okay, I need to go to Asia to find people to take that night shift because they're six, seven Smart. hours ahead. Yeah. So I went to Thailand and Vietnam that trip and started expanding out there. And I didn't think I would like Southeast Asia as much as I did, but specifically Thailand was just like, oh my God. This really? Culture. Why? Did, why did it hit you so, so hard? It's a feeling. Um, it's a similar feeling to Serbia. It's like, really? um, yeah, this, 
this feeling of a culture that's open to the world yet mm-hmm. does its own thing. Like mm. it has its own traditional culture, which is mm-hmm. very strong and very satisfying to the people. Mm-hmm. But they're also open and friendly to everyone. That's mm-hmm. the two common. That's the sort of commonality between Thailand and Serbia. Um, you know, some people might not like Serbia. Some people might not like Thailand. But I love both of those countries, and they're very special for me. Like just because I, I don't know. It's just like there's something so. Honest about life in both of them, and real about life in both of them, and that's why I've chosen to um, set those up as my destinations. Um, you know, like the other places where where I've where had, did you went also except Thailand? What yeah, yeah, go yeah. Further? Colombia, Panama, Mexico, South mm-hmm. Africa, all over Europe. You know, all these di- different places. I've been to Indonesia, to mm-hmm. Bali, all this sort of stuff. And it's like, yeah. But then you need to find those places that where you really want to set up your long term mm-hmm. sort of happiness and maybe fair enough. M- yes, so rent you can stay. or buy some sort of property. So I guess there. It's yeah. for the beginning, it was interesting to travel and to change places and yes. go from South Africa to Bali and just yes. to change but especially then, since I was building the business while doing it and there's stuff to exactly, do exactly yeah. yeah and people to meet and stuff like that but it just ultimately became something that uh, the heart longs for stability it longs for um, familiarity and all that sort of stuff mm-hmm. and so now this year is going to be seven months in Thailand and five months in Serbia well less than five months in Serbia but definitely wow. seven months in Thailand and just um Trying to make my start my life in Thailand and get the musicians who want to be um, both in Europe and Asia with me, um, getting them on board. So that's mm-hmm. happening soon. Did you rent uh, a place there, or how did you organize no, the seven I, I, months I there? Had, I was there four months already, and I'm going back October, November, December. Mm-hmm. So you have some connections and, and know how to get along. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's easy there. Everything in Thailand is really easy as a foreigner. They're really set up for tourist infrastructure. It's easy to rent short term, long term, whatever you want. So I'm going to take that in October. Are you afraid that if Corona comes again, that you may be stuck there? Because I know some people who want there, to travel and they're all afraid to... I was stuck there for the first lockdown on the island of Koh Phangan, a tropical island for the first lockdown, March 2020. I was there. It was the best thing ever. It was like, you yeah, read the news. You're stuck in a tropical was, island. Yeah, so exactly. Bad. Like, you can go anywhere with your motorbike, still go to the beach, swim, whatever, supermarket, whatever. Not much changed, except for they closed, like, uh, the bars and restaurants for a bit. Then they reopened restaurants. It, it wasn't a huge shock. Um, but when I hear about what people went through in Belgrade during April and March 2020, mm-hmm. it sounds horrible. Um, and all everyone I know who lives in cities, they were just pretty much at home. Whereas I was on a tropical island with nature with and beach. stuff like that. So I'm not afraid. I hope, I hope that if 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 it does come back, then I'll be there. Which is why I'm going Sounds there like from October plan. until April next year. Mm-hmm. So you know, and I was in Mexico for last year, um, from October Where till December, Tulum, which is a sort of hippie beach town, mm-hmm. um, popular with expats and. Stuff like that. I don't like it as much as the island of Copenhagen, but it was also a nice time. It was mm-hmm. also lots of really what cool people. What was special about that place? Tulum is, um, yeah, so it's a similar vibe to Copenhagen. Lots of people um, who are looking for alternative lifestyles, like, um, you know, lots of yoga going on, lots of uh, mm-hmm. healthy living and all that sort of stuff. Both Copenhagen and Tulum are hotspots for this sort of like what they call the conscious community, which is people who are looking for, yeah, people who are looking for. Yeah, just the next level of, of like, uh, lifestyle. So, yeah, health and wellness, but also lots of parties and lots of interesting events, you know, like workshops, like uh, self-development mm-hmm. stuff. Like, I don't know. Like but I, it's hard stuff. to imagine that you got lonely there. I think you were, you met no, some interesting people. No, it's not loneliness. It's, it's just like, um, it's not loneliness. Like, you can meet other people anytime, but it's just like um, having people who you know well. Mm, okay, I get it. Having friends that you've known for years, that feeling. Mm-hmm, yeah, so it took me it. years to build that up, up in Belgrade. I very much have it so here now. It's a circle, I guess. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and the feeling that you know a place. Yeah. Mm. Because to belong somewhere, maybe? Yeah, it's always an adjustment of like, um, you know, five to ten days before you get to a place. Uh, and when, when you get to a place before you feel at home there. So I stayed in Mexico for two months and in Thailand for four months. So that's a good amount of time. But every, every moment I spent in Mexico, I was missing Thailand so much because I prefer it. So that feeling mm-hmm. of mi- wanting to be in another place and being in a place kind of like, that's how I felt about Belgrade when I lived in Toronto. And it's just like, yeah, that, that feels lonely. And I just can't wait to get back to Thailand in October. 
and start my next chapter there and hit the next level of like friends and and um you know events and all that sort of stuff and organizing groups like uh, when i was there in thailand last last year or last uh earlier this year i made a group for entrepreneurs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um which was very very interesting for me um what kind of group yeah just um aspiring and actual entrepreneurs um mm -hmm. just helping them with the issues and and giving there, my experience in yeah yeah giving my experience back to people and helping inspire them to maybe think on the level that will lead to a successful venture and hearing from the other people who have made a successful a successful a full venture and like made it like a made oh, it a success so yeah, it's so. good to hear if someone wants to join you or support you he will find you uh now in belgrade until october yeah and after october you will be in thailand then yeah in Copenhagen, you said yeah and i don't know after that after April, I don't know. I'll probably be a lot here in Belgrade, but I'm also planning to play a lot with the band. Mm -hmm. So assuming. who knows, maybe somebody hears our podcast and say, well, Eric is a cool guy. Yeah. I would like to support or yeah. to work something with him. So so you can go on, Eric. yeah, Belgrade Beat is the Belgrade Focus channel on YouTube. Rising Nomad is the sort of international remote working um, health and wellness sort of digital nomad sort of focused ch channel. And you can check out Support Adventure which um, also has a YouTube channel <laughs> and a website. If you're an IT technician looking for work you can do remotely, um, please apply on our website and we'll see what we can do for you. And also Eric and the Worldly Savages, also a YouTube channel. So you can check that out. And um, yeah, basically that's, uh, that's me and all my different ways, but I feel it all fits together in one message and one personality, which is me, the crazy guy from Canada who decided he couldn't live there anymore because it was too boring and wanted to see what the world had to offer him. Wow, Rick, thank you for this uh, wonderful conversation thank and you, all the Marina. information you, you gave to us. It was a pleasure listening to you and also very inspiring. Yep. So I wish you all the best. Let's stay in touch. Yeah, thanks a lot. And just stay the way you are and uh, go for it. Great. Thanks. thanks. It was a pleasure to do this. Thanks. Bye now. Bye. <laughs> Ciao, everybody. Ciao.